And so there's no universal ethic. It's, it's solely dependent on your actual position. And the very fact that in these like autonomous Marxist conceptions of class, they think everybody can be revolutionary in a sense. Um, workers, teachers, housewives, uh, students, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I, it seems to me that the very notion of biopower as itself playing out that doesn't lead to any sort of revolutionary practice because capital tends to swallow everything. And when you engage in positive projects, they get swallowed by capital. Yeah, well, I mean, and it's worth noting, Crime Think puts out a lot of books that are for sale to make them money. Crime Think being this uh, lifestyle anarchist where you dumpster dive and you put subversive messages on corporate ads and all that jazz. Um, so let's move to the final main branch, uh, which is deontology. Uh, and deontology is, I believe, Greek for duty-based ethics. Um, ontology, right, it's worth noting, is from being. And Kant, of course, is the most famous deontologist. And so the basic reasoning for Kant is, look, we're all human beings, which means we all have universal reason. And it's this universal reason that grounds all of us. We all have it. We all can use it. We don't necessarily, we don't necessarily use it, but we all could use it. So what happens is we have these imperatives, right, these commands on how to do things. Right? Because reason presents us with the world, and we interact with that world, and there's all that jazz. There are two kinds of imperatives. There's a hypothetical imperative, which is based on our situation. And there's a categorical imperative, which is a pure imperative of reason. So, for example, I might have a, 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 a categorical imperative of self-preservation, we'll say. Well, a hypothetical uh, imperative right, is subordinated to the categorical imperative. So, for example, I have a, a self-preservation um, imperative, and so I need to eat, right? But eating is not a categorical imperative, right? It's a means, it's a selection of how to obtain that. So, um, Kant formulates his categorical imperative in a couple of interesting ways. Um, I'm just going to go over the two main uh, formulations of the categorical imperative, but he has a bunch of them, so I'd highly encourage you to look them up. Um, the first and most famous is acts only in according to the maxim where you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. So a maxim is a reason for action, like self-preservation, or I want something, uh, and then you have to will it as though everyone could also will it. So again, this is where a lot of people get hung up. The, you will a categorical imperative, you don't will a hypothetical imperative, right? Everyone can will to do the that basic necessities of self-preservation, right? Because if we all didn't, the human, human race would be extinguished. So we could categorically uh, will self-preservation, right? This would make perfect sense. What we can't do is we can't all will to go to the bathroom at the same time, right? We clog the pipes, they would break, etc., etc. This is not a problem because, again, that's a hypothetical imperative. But the main imperative, the categorical imperative of self-preservation, which, unless you want your kidneys exploding, occasionally in, uh, you know, entails from time to time using the facilities, we can still will that, right? So this is where a lot of people get hung up. It's not about willing a hypothetical. It's about willing a categorical, right? It needs to be universally applicable to everyone at all times. Just really quickly, though, it's about um making it so there's not an exclusive right for you to do something that others can't do. Yeah, lying is the primary example, yeah. right? If I lie to someone, what I have to do is I have to will myself as an exception, right? Because why would anyone believe my lie? Well, people believe lies because generally speaking, everyone tells the truth, right? The vast majority of the time you tell the truth, and the only reason you get away with a lie is because everyone expects you to tell the truth. Right, so this is the hypocrisy of right, not having a categorical imperative. I have willed myself as an exception to the rule. The rule is everyone tells the truth except for me, so then I can get away with it. Right? And so this is how that, that maxim works. I need to make it a universal law. And if I made lying a universal law, no one would believe anyone anyway, and I couldn't get away with my lie. Right? So you'll see how that doesn't work. 
The next is act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or the person of any other, always at the same time as an end, nearly as a means. Or not merely as a means. Now this is also another place where people get hung up. Not merely as a means. So if I say, hey, could you do me a favor and uh, get me a drink of water? And they go, sure. I'm not using you merely as a means, right? Because you have a choice in the matter, right? I am trusting to your autonomy, right? Your right to choose on whether to give me a drink of water or not. So simply saying, hey, could you do something for me, is not in and of itself a violation of autonomy or of using people, right? It's a merely as a means. So this, of course, throws us into autonomy. What is autonomy? Uh, most people think of this as free will. This is incorrect. Um, autonomy is our ability to choose our imperatives. I cannot stress this enough. This is what the free will means. It doesn't mean being able to do anything at all times, in all ways, however we want. It means being able to choose our imperatives. So let me give two examples one of which violates someone's autonomy, and one that does not. So for example, anyone here like Edgar Allan Poe? Um, I'll go with the yes. OK, very good. Um, <laughs> I, 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 yes, I forget exactly what the, um, uh, what the name of the story is, so if anyone has it, feel free to shout it out. But what happens is one dude really, really hates another dude. Now, of course, this isn't very descriptive, because all toes like that. Um, but he says, what you should do is you should come to the catacombs, because I have a cask of Amontillado, right? It's, uh, I believe it's a wine or a liquor, and it's really good. So he says, come to the catacombs, and I have a cask of Amontillado. He then proceeds to trap him and wall him into the wall, uh, so he dies, right? OK, so here's why that violates the autonomy. The choice being offered is, Come to the catacombs and have alcohol with me, or don't come to the catacombs and have alcohol with me, right? But as a matter of fact, it violates his autonomy because the real choice is come to the catacombs and have me kill you, or don't come to the catacombs and have me not kill you, right? You'll notice if you offered him that choice, uh, barring some suicidal aggressivity, it's very unlikely that he would come to the catacombs. Let's compare this with Maximilien Robespierre's and the Committee of Public Safety, Law of the Maximum. What the Law of the Maximum says is there is a maximum on the price of bread. And if you hoard bread, or you sell bread at above that cost, um, you will get a haircut a little off the top. Uh, if you don't know, this is one of the jokes of the guillotine. You know, you're getting a haircut just a little off the top. This does not violate anyone's autonomy. There is a clear law, which is, if you try to hoard or sell bread for a price greater than the law of the maximum, we will kill you. Now you are free to choose, right? And so you'll notice, it is not about having your freedom infringed, or next time you hear a libertarian say, well, I hate the government because it infringes on my autonomy, the only way it infringes on your autonomy is if it says that it's going to do something which it doesn't. Which, of course, again, our current government does all the time. But that is not an essential argument against the state proper. The state can still respect autonomy and remain incredibly repressive so long as the laws are clear. Uh, there's one real big exception. Um, and, and this, is, this is a sort of oppression that is not acceptable. Nazism. Surprise, surprise. The reason why Nazism is not acceptable is because a Jew, for Nazis, right, you could have an incredible, it, theoretically, it would still be a violation of autonomy. Um, but if you are radically Christian and not particularly observant or bright, you could outlaw Judaism but then allow any Jew to convert to Christianity. This would be a terrible system. It would almost certainly be unjust. But if you have a really distorted worldview, it could theoretically be possible. The Nazis did not do this. There was nothing in the freedom 
of the Jews to cease being a Jew. And so this was a fundamental violation of autonomy. 